The following presentation is a production of Ride the Wave Media. It's the Best Birth Podcast, where we interview experts that elevate you as you prepare your heart and mind to have the best birth. Each episode, we'll interview professionals so you are prepared for pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. Our experts will build your confidence and empower you to trust your intuition throughout your pregnancy. This audio is taken from videos on YouTube. Watch the entire episodes on YouTube at Birth Made Mindful. Welcome to the Best Birth Podcast. Our guest today is Taryn McCormick, our gastroenterologist. Taryn has been a GI physician's assistant for nearly seven years. She is passionate about helping patients make informed decisions regarding their medical care, often providing resources to promote their well-being. You can find Taryn outside at the Parker Splash Pad with her kids, hiking or biking with her girlfriends. Welcome, Taryn. We're so excited to have you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Well, we are anticipatory of a great conversation, how gastroenterology applies to pregnancy and birth. When I was trying to put together all of our experts, I thought, you know, we better touch on one of the topics that is just not talked a lot about in in birth, in pregnancy, and maybe like some of the ways that we can help manage our GI and, and the needs that we have. Um, can you give us like just a little overview about why this might be important in pregnancy? Sure. So um, GI uh, affects everyone, right? So we all we all have a GI tract, and when growing a little human in your abdomen, it puts pressure on all the abdominal organs, making some things a bit more uncomfortable. So some women become really constipated. So, I mean, just one under the other. You know, bowel habit changes. Um, heartburn can become really frequent during pregnancy um, just because you've got increased pressure again in the abdomen there's a valve between your esophagus and your stomach and when there's increased pressure in the abdomen it kind of relaxes that valve uh, making it easier for the acid in our stomach which is normal to come up into the esophagus which is not comfortable or normal not usually when people describe feeling that heartburn or acid reflux sensation can you tell us a little bit more about how we could either prevent acid reflux or help manage our symptoms? So unfortunately, having something in your abdomen is going, is, it highly increases the odds of having heartburn. Uh, when I talk to patients about, you know, whether they're pregnant or not pregnant, okay, these are the foods that can, you know, make heartburn worse. This, these are other factors like lying flat, which you can elevate the head of the bed eight to 10 inches. That can sometimes help a little bit. Um, whether it's using a wedge pillow or blocks underneath the bedpost at the head of the bed just to help keep that acid down into your stomach. But we also mentioned like, you know, being overweight, uh, pregnancy. So for patients who aren't pregnant but suffer from obesity or, you know, other weight related, uh, you know, difficulties, having that increase, uh, any increased uh, pressure in that abdomen is going to increase your risk of reflux. But there are some dietary things, but as I mentioned, that can be done like, uh, tobacco, alcohol, caffeine, and hopefully, you know, uh, there isn't tobacco and alcohol use during pregnancy. Um, but caffeine certainly can relax that valve as well. Um, spicy food, citrusy food, fatty, greasy food. So a lot of these, you know, food triggers can make it even worse. So trying to limit at least the dietary component can maybe lessen the severity of the heartburn. And there are medications that can help. Uh, manage the symptoms as well. I always recommend that patients check with their OB or their midwife to verify which you know medications they feel are the safest for them. So there are safe options out there to help manage. That's great advice. Taking you know just a small Tums capsule could help me um, at night if I was having that acid reflux. But then it seemed like my last month of pregnancy was there every time I laid down, and so I really had to be careful about you know like you said reclining all the way versus right. just like giving myself a little bit of time or easing into the bed instead of just going straight from like you know walking around to then laying down every night. Yeah, another thing that can be done is. Uh, avoiding uh, any like snack, evening snacking or like eating for several hours before you lay down to allow the food content from the stomach uh, acid to really you know leave the stomach before you go horizontal or you know semi horizontal. So um, that's another thing that we often would recommend is like trying to eat dinner earlier, avoid evening snacking. But that's can be hard when you're really hungry with pregnancy. So you know you you just try and do the best you can. 
Um, as far as tongues go, they are, you know, generally okay to use. You just want to be cautious of uh, how many you take a day. And if you're needing more than like 2000 milligrams or so, um, you want to just move to probably another option that helps prevent heartburn. Uh, medications like omeprazole, prilosec, PPIs. There are some of those that can be um, very helpful in heartburn, but again, I always check with your OB and see like, do they run a review on that or something that's a little different type heartburn medication called an H2 blocker, like, uh, which is Pepsid or Famotidine. I think it's so great to just talk about our options and knowing that if something over the counter isn't quite doing the job, that kind of moving to that next level of maybe getting a prescription and talking with your physician to see what, what the next options are is so, so great. Yeah. You spoke a little bit about constipation, and I think this is really important to address because there are natural ways that you can help to combat this during pregnancy. What are some of your best advices? So for patients wanting more natural options, I recommend fiber. So uh, fiber can be very helpful in both managing diarrhea and constipation, just kind of like regulating your stool. Um, so some patients do really well with like say prune juice. If you don't like prune juice, you can always try mixing it with apple juice or grape juice to kind of lessen that strong flavor. Um, Metamucil is another really good fiber option. It comes in a powder form. There are gummies available, though I have heard that the gummies maybe can cause more gas and things like that. You have to really be careful. There's a balance between like getting too much fiber and then you have bloating and, you know, a lot of passing gas. And that's not, you know, anyone's favorite thing either. So uh, just finding that balance can be a little bit tricky, but it's doable. So dietary options are by far, you know, a good option or preferred but there are medications again to help if you feel like oh you're not like getting the relief you want with just adding fiber another thing to keep in mind is that fiber without enough water is not going to do a good job so um both fiber and Miralax, uh which is not a fiber supplement it's a dual softener powder not a laxative uh it's just a softener they work by uh, helping to keep water in the stool rather than being absorbed back into the through the intestinal wall and if you don't have enough water to work with, I tell patients, like, basically your poop is dehydrated. You know, if you're having these little hard pellets that are like deer poop, like, you're not getting enough hydration or you're not having enough, like, fiber or softener to keep the water in your poop. So it's a combination effort, I feel like, between fiber or softeners uh, or sometimes both of those with water. You spoke about diarrhea also being affected by our fiber intake. So that, can that actually regulate... Yeah, so we, it's a, a kind of a phenomenon to me, but I, I know that we have used fiber for people who suffer from really loose or mushy stool, helpful things up. Uh, and again, it's kind of like, how does that work? I don't know exactly uh, how to explain it best, but we just based on experience have seen that uh, it can help soften stool, as mentioned, and also helpful things up. So people who may suffer from some fecal leakage, uh, we usually recommend trying fiber to help bulk things up first and see if that helps reduce that. Let's talk about that first poop after delivery. Why is everything so messed up or, you know, in, inhibited? So if you think about the process of childbirth, right, especially if it's a vaginal deliver, there's been a lot going on down there, a lot of pushing, a lot of pressure. So a lot of, I, I think I was in the same boat. When I had my first baby, I was like, okay, I just really want to make sure I don't have a hard poop. Like, that just sounds so awful, especially when there's so much tenderness down down in the pelvic, uh, you know, area. And so um, I had a, <clears throat> a fellow PA who told me, make sure you tell your medical team that you want to be on stool softener as, like, as soon as you're in the hospital. So um, I was like, please make sure this is scheduled, you know, twice a day. Like, I don't want to get constipated or other things be on the mushy or, you know, really south side. So that's how I went about it was just making sure I, you know, uh, was taking a docky state, which is a stool softener, a couple of times a day. Another thing that can help is p proper positioning. So uh, I actually, with my first uh, child, I asked the nurses for a stepping stool, similar to like a squatty potty, so that it could help, you know, with the proper anatomic, you know, position for defecation, you know, even without pregnancy and without having that uh, fear of having a hard poop, like people who struggle with constipation in general, uh, things can just release better when we open up the 
open things up uh, properly. So having your knees up a little bit higher. You don't have to have them totally squatting like you're on the ground squatting, but um, having your knees up high enough that it allows a better pupil repellent muscle, uh, you know, just relaxation. So I actually asked the nurses to find uh, a stool and it took them, you know, a few hours to find, you know, something in a utility closet, I think. But on my second birth, I actually brought a little toddler, like collapsible, stepping stool from home so I didn't have to bother the nurses and I could uh, you know uh, utilize that assistance uh, with having a bowel movement and I think with a combination of stool softeners proper positioning um, that can be a lot less uh, uncomfortable you know and things can go smoothly having those tools as well I think can help your body to relax for me I think it was more of like a mental game like I had prepped myself that it would be so difficult and so then it was like a self-fulfilling prophecy sure. that came to pass um so my first baby was a c-section and I remember also struggling in the after delivery stool and that was a real big surprise for me and so I think that to bring that to awareness that, that yeah. even if you have a c-section but like Taryn said, just utilizing that stool, making sure you're on stool softeners, you know, maybe even adding the Metamucil or the fiber to your diet so that you're prepared for, for whatever might happen. Yeah. One other thing uh, that probably varies depending on the type of delivery is uh, if you're having a medicated birth or an unmedicated birth. As far as pain control, because we do know that pain medications slow the GI tract down and increase the risk for constipation. So if, you know, if you're not having a Medicaid birth, you may not need as much of the stool softener, you know, preventative uh, approach, but I would definitely recommend if you're planning, you know, for those that plan to have uh, medication during labor and childbirth, that they talk to their medical team about the constipation uh, management. Such a great point. Let's talk about another reason GI physicians could be beneficial during pregnancy. Uh, hemorrhoids. Can you tell us about hemorrhoids and what they are? Sure. Hemorrhoids, and I wanted to add one other thing, anal fissures. I feel like they are under-recognized and very, very common. Um, so hemorrhoids are blood vessels. I actually, I don't know if you can see very well. I have a little, oh, I have a fissure pamphlet, not the hemorrhoid one. But we will um, we'll talk about hemorrhoids first. So they're normal vascular structures or blood vessels inside the rectum. And Everybody has hemorrhoids as part of our anatomy. Okay, so what happens when there's a lot of pressure? Again, this can be both in pregnancy or without being pregnant. Um, but whenever there's increased pressure on the pelvic floor, uh, that can increase the risk for swelling of those blood vessels. And that then can lead to symptoms that are uncomfortable, like anal itching, uh, because the hemorrhoids can prolapse through the anal canal and deposit mucus around the anus and so that's a really um i feel like a lot of patients they don't think they have hemorrhoids unless they have like swelling on the outside or like a bulge like an external hemorrhoid so there's internal hemorrhoids and external hemorrhoids the external ones are very very painful and you just have, kind of have to give them time like both of both op, both hemorrhoid um situations you want to like soften your stool avoid straining those kind of things um but the external ones are painful. Internal ones are not painful, but they can cause, like I said, the anal itching. They can both cause bleeding, but more so I'd say the internal ones until the external ones open up and then they uh, cause some bleeding. Um, some prolapse. So again, when the, the um, during defecation, when the hemorrhoids hit, they can, the tissue can prolapse through the anus. And then sometimes patients actually have to like tuck them back in. and because it's like, oh, there's something kind of like sticking out of my bottom there. Um, and so tucking it back in provides some relief from like, oh, there's something there. Um, so if that's something that happens, definitely want to bring that to your medical provider's attention and come most likely see GI to um, talk about uh, treatment options, which would be after delivery. We wouldn't do anything during pregnancy or until after, you know, the first, uh, your, your six week checkup, it would have to be after that. Um, <clears throat> but, Let's see, the other symptoms are the perianal swelling and, um, oh yeah, stool leakage. So when, if you think about it, kind of like a foot in the door, it keeps the door from closing all the way. So if you have some tissue uh, kind of prolapsing in between the anal sphincters, which are our muscles that help with, with help us with continence, 
uh, then they can't close all the way. And so sometimes when asked, you know, patients will say, yeah, oh, I noticed like I have some stool leaking into my underwear or like after I know I've cleaned, but I have to go back like an hour or two later and like wipe again, but I know I clean, like what's going on? And it's usually because there's something in the way of closing that. So those are five, the five symptoms, anal itching, bleeding, perianal swelling, prolapse, and uh, what, what did I say with the other one? Itching, bleeding, swelling, prolapse, leakage. I was, anyways, uh, so those are things to watch out for and then bring to your minor's attention because there are options to help with that. A lot of times it is kind of like a waiting game. You know, you have to like get the baby out of there. You have to be done with the baby, you know, with delivery if you're doing vaginal delivery. Um, because things have to heal and then sometimes you don't even need intervention like medically it's just a matter of time things can heal on their own yeah and so while you're pregnant are the creams the most effective remedy um i would say yes uh softening the stool number one right you want to prevent that constipation and added pressure in the pelvic floor you want to avoid sitting on the toilet for prolonged periods of time some people like to take their phone or books and just like that's their checkout time that is not a good idea you want to get in eat your business get out like two three minutes and then get out the longer you are sitting on a toilet which is not supporting your pelvic floor it's only surround you know supporting your you know area around the pelvic floor not underneath uh, so that's going to increase your risk for prolapse uh, or just uh, not necessarily prolapse, but increased swelling of the hemorrhoid vessels that can then cause those other symptoms that I mentioned. Does that make sense? And then you also spoke about treatment after delivery. So what are our options if we've done everything, you know, on our own and we're still having those external hemorrhoids? So external hemorrhoids, again, those are not usually treated with procedure unless it's uh, in the first 72 hours or so of having an external hemorrhoid, uh, they can be lanced. Usually that's done by a surgeon. Um, after that, it's just waiting, you know, doing sit baths. Uh, so kind of helping with some soothing discomfort there. Um, and the creams can be help a little bit helpful, like lidocaine, something like it's numbing, right? Uh, and then you can also, if it's approved by your OB, if you're uh, lactating or if you are breastfeeding, um, you know, using things like NSAIDs or Tylenol to help with some of that discomfort. The internal hemorrhoid, uh, after the six-week checkup, we, if you are having prolapse uh, of the internal hemorrhoids, we can go ahead and do a procedure called banding, hemorrhoid banding, where we take a little device and suction some of that extra tissue up, deploy a little band, and after two to four days, the band and the tissue just fall off. It creates a little ulcer. Uh, and then as that ulcer heals, it scars, and it's almost like a little rectal lift, if you can kind of imagine that, like, you know, as skin, as a sore or ulcer heals, it tightens, right? So it kind of provides some lift there. So patients usually chuckle when I say, so, you know, like a, a rectal lift, uh, you know, it's uh, just kind of lifting up some of the tissue that got stretched out and, and things like that. Thank you so much. I think it's really necessary to, to have this conversation so that we know our options and that we have a plan. You know, if we're saying, okay, this is my last baby, I'm ready to, to go in and have this done, then we can call our GI doctor and, and schedule that appointment. If you know that you're done with babies, you know, to have hemorrhoid banding, that's something that if, if the symptoms are bothering you and you're done, you know, you pass that six week, uh, six to eight week uh, point after delivery, procedures are an option. Um, in fact, you it's helpful to take care of hemorrhoids if they're still problematic at that point, the internal hemorrhoids, because if left untreated or just using creams and things like that, sometimes then they can progress from what we call a grade two or grade three hemorrhoid, which prolapses and goes back in by itself, or grade three is prolapses and you have to kind of cut it back in. Uh, grade four is they prolapse and there is no moving them. It's just so significant that they can't be tucked back in. And that then becomes a surgical issue, which is not fun. Like nobody wants to have surgery around their bottom. Uh, and so, unless it's really needed, and in which case, like you do what you gotta do. Uh, but I would uh, just counsel, you know, all women, if you're having any anal rectal symptoms, make sure you don't like dismiss them because of embarrassment, like that's really very common.
and there are things that we can do about it. Anal fissures, uh, if you guys don't mind, I want to talk to you a little bit about anal fissures. So anal fissures, uh, again, are, can be a complication from constipation, which is very common, as we discussed. So a fissure is kind of like a crack, you know, if you're really dry around your lips and you've had those cracks, you kind of know that's a type of fissure. So when you are having too part of a bowel movement and the sphincter, the muscle stretches open too large, it can cause a crack. Usually it's in the backside of the anus, sometimes right along the front towards the vagina. So the an what we call the anterior midline um, can happen, but posterior is most common. Just less vascular um, supply there. It's like slower to heal. And so those are things to watch out for. If you're having anal pain, that is a tall tail sign of an anal fissure. So if you don't have a bulge on the outside and you're like, oh, I don't think I have an external hemorrhoid, but I'm having like terrible pain when I poop and it just feels like Sometimes patients will say like, oh, I feel like I'm pooping a porcupine or like glass shards and it's just, you don't want to poop because it's so painful. Uh, that can be treated and there's actually a special, uh, it's not over the counter, it's a compounded ointment. So a prescription cream uh, that can help that area heal. So that is something I see so often and I've had some sweet women come in like, you know, eight months, a year after pregnancy too. And I'm like, you've been dealing with this pain for how long? I'm like, oh, bless you. Like, I wish you would have come in sooner. We could have, you know, easily gotten this treated so much sooner and provided relief. So I feel like that is the one very under uh, diagnosed and under treated be because of, you know, feeling embarrassed about it or just feeling like, oh, it's going to get better. I just need to give it time. And then like before they know it, months have gone by. After we have wrapped up our maternal care at that six week appointment. Is that when you also recommend calling your GI doctor or would you say there's a couple of more weeks to p potentially heal? Um, I think that by the six week mark, you should be okay to come in for any anal rectal, you know, uh, treatment option. Are there times that these anal fissures do go away on their own? Yes, they can. Uh, so if it's not um, as chronic, oh, it just happened during birth, you know, from pushing really hard, it's very common for women to push hard enough, you know, to get a baby out that they're also pooping, right? Uh, and so uh, sometimes if their poop is harder, you can have a fissure during that time or after delivery, just really, you can get a fissure whenever, sadly. It's uh, one of those things, but what things we could do that, uh, or if they can go away naturally. If you soften your stool, yes, they can go away, you know, and heal on their own. Um, sits baths, again, are encouraged. Uh, using just like warm, not hot, hot water. You don't need to use like salt, you know, Epsom salts, but you can, like it doesn't harm anything. Um, so yeah, they can, you can do some just, you know, dietary options to help. But if not, if, it, if it's persisting after a couple of weeks, I'd say, you know, go on and get an evaluation done. Yes. Uh, just two quick experiences. I've had two anal fissures and the first one was when I found out I was pregnant with my first. I had written off pregnancy because we had tried for about a year and I had just started the school year so I was going to focus on that and I, I had this pain every time I was pooping and there was blood and so I I went to the doctor and they took a pregnancy test in the doctor's office and that's how I found out I was pregnant. So very interesting way to find out you're pregnant. I remember that experience and the doctor just said, yeah, if it keeps going, come back in. But if not, see if it goes away on its own. And it did go away on its own. And then later I had one after birth and pregnancy and that one went away on its own too. So it probably wasn't as yeah. severe. If, it, if the constipation has been more of a chronic issue, um, I would say the likelihood of needing treatment is higher, right? So chronic issues usually need treatment. Taryn, this conversation has been so valuable. Thank you so much for just informing us and letting us know that there is help out there. Would you say that there's anything else you would recommend for you know our care postpartum? <laughs> right? So uh, no, just coming from a fellow you know uh, mother, uh, stress management really can wreak havoc on the GI tract. So it's such a hard time to have a good balance of you know, self-care when you're providing around the clock care to an infant. Uh, but do what you can to take care of yourself as well, because we do know that there is, you know, our GI tract is actually just filled with uh, serotonin uh, receptors. And so when anxiety and stress are way out of 
control, which is not uncommon, you know, after uh, giving birth and so many hormones just changing that uh, your GI tract can also be affected by that. So trying to take care of uh, yourself both during pregnancy, after delivery, like remembering you're still a human, you know, that has needs uh, and trying to, I don't think anyone can do it on their own, right? So when we try and be super mom uh, and take care of the baby, oftentimes we're neglecting ourselves uh, if we aren't enlisting help of others. So it's okay, I feel like, to, uh, you know, accept those those uh, meals and accept people to help, you know, come fold your laundry so you can get a nap or what, you know, whatever it may be to help manage your stress. So. What a great reminder to sleep, to enlist the village, and to take care of ourselves. Um, there's a great book that's called The First 40 Days that talk about your nutrition after delivery. And Hano said, your body has just done the most incredible thing. It created and delivered a new human being. Now is the time to honor, nurture, and give back to yourself with the same dedication you gave to growing your baby. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Every week we share a mom squad secret. This one comes from Hannah. She says, ask one of the nurses to squeeze your hips during contractions. Your spouse could also do it. Remember that you are strong and your body was made to do this. Great reminder. Taryn, is there anything else you would recommend to us to prepare our hearts and our minds for pregnancy and birth? I think we covered, you know, quite a bit. So thank you for uh, having me on your podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for joining us on today's episode. We hope you've been elevated and inspired by this week's expert. Subscribe today so you never miss an episode. And please share our podcast or post on your social media so that other moms and dads-to-be can also have the best birth. Please note that the information provided is based on the expert's insights and personal experience. It is not intended as medical guidance. Please seek the advice of your medical provider as it applies to your specific condition.